What's important is our keynote speaker, Miriam Ross, who is travelled possibly the furthest of anybody to get here from New Zealand. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Nick. Um, it's, and thank you to the committee for inviting me here. It's a huge privilege. I've been following this conference for many years, and I've never had the chance to come, so I really appreciate the opportunity. And also, from the last two days, seeing the incredible work that's been done um, and... Andrew Woods highlighted that yesterday in his presentation where he showed the huge influence that the papers coming from this conference have had on our understanding of stereoscopy, displays, imaging, so on. So um, I'm a little bit nervous that what I'm about to show you is going to get me kicked out of the conference. <laughs> Bear with me, I promise it will all make sense by the end. So in 2015, I produced and exhibited a stereoscopic work called 3D Cats with Vertical Video Syndrome. It was what it said on the tin. It was 3D, well, cats filmed in 3D, turned on, well, they weren't turned on the side, but the display was turned on its side. So similar to the vertical videos that many people film on their phones. What, you may ask, was this monstrosity? Why was I taking a perfectly good passive LG TV turning on its side, that a kind of strange magenta hue came out of the parallax between the cats. Why did I not use the Genus Hurricane rig with um, Genlock technology, Canon C300s, and matching lenses that we have in our department? That's my colleague Paul. We have the technology. Why, why did I strap together two Sony uh, Handycams onto this terribly shoddy piece of wood? Why didn't I at least use professional cat actors, you may ask? Well, um, those are good questions. Um, not, I don't even have the answers to all of them, but I will get to, we'll come back to this, that it will make sense as to why I took this rather strange DIY, very imperfect approach to stereoscopic technology. So if we go back in time first, um, to the 19th century, our scientific pioneers, we've um, got a couple of names up there, David Brewster, Charles Wheatstone, were very concerned with understanding stereoscopic vision, thinking about how displays could teach us about that um, by not our binocular processes. So they're often very concerned with, um, for example, mimicking our natural perception. Brewster in particular, along with John F. Masher, became quite obsessed with making sure the camera aperture would very much match um, the biology of the eye, that the interaxial distance between cameras would very closely match the interocular distance, those kinds of things. Um, so one thing that Brewster did do was that following on from his knowledge of Wheatstone's pseudoscope, he asked viewers to invert left and right images to show them, look, if you invert it, you get inverted depth, and that therefore proves my theories around normal depth relations. Um, and we saw some of this yesterday. Rob Allison's fantastic talk showed what happened. What did happen, and what viewers became really interested in was, were the, uh, the anomalies that, wait a second, why is depth not inverting? Why are still some things still popping towards us? And again, we saw these great examples yesterday of that. So Brewster was kind of saying, oh, well, sure, <laughs> that will happen. But the most important thing is it still proves my theories around normal depth. But the viewers were most interested in these anomalies. They were interested in the imperfections. It became very intriguing for them. Um, Rob Banches has got a great article about it where they become fascinated by instances where the mind dismisses the testimony of binocular convergences and refuses to invert volumes or reposition objects. So for a lot of viewers, this became far more interesting than what they were meant to be learning about visual processes. So in some ways, it was the imperfection which became the interest. And this happened again and around a similar time period with ghost images. So as you'll probably know, if you don't have a dual lens camera, what you can do and what was quite popular in the early, or the early stages of stereoscopy was to um, film with one camera or shoot an image with one camera, move the interaxial distance, shoot a second image, there you've got your stereo set. But when you're doing urban environments, quite common was that um, 
an object, a moving object, such as the carriage here. Again, sorry, it's quite faint, but the carriage here or a person, they would disappear from one image to the next. You put these together in your stereoscope, and you've got this really interesting ghost-like image, a kind of phantasm apparition. So it was a mistake. It was an error. It was an imperfection in the image. But as with the anomalies of the pseudoscope or pseudoscopic images, viewers became really fascinated. Often these stereoscopic image sets became collector's items. Um, so again, interesting here is how we as humans become fascinated by the unexpected, by the imperfections, but also had a really interesting legacy, which was, well, first of all, sorry, going back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, he himself picked up on this fascination. The more evidently accidental the introduction, the more trivial they are in themselves, the more they take hold of the imagination, the more they excite us. But they also had that lasting legacy of spirit photography. So spirit photography <laughs> was a little bit dubious in the 19th century. People were claiming that you would see your deceased relative and they would bring them back to life for you. Um, but not everyone was duped by this. And they actually became an incredible part of the kind of cultural imagination of the 19th century. But even more so than that, it paved the way for the trick photography used by filmmakers such as George Méliès, um, which really sparked off um, special effects in cinema as we know it. So we have this great legacy of what was an error to begin with, suddenly producing a side industry and producing something that kind of really became quite productive. So in the 19th century, a lot of the concern was with photography and how that could help us understand our imaging systems. Um, there was, of course, experiments um, looking at kind of graphic images and what they could tell us. But at least publicly, everyone's expecting to see stereoscopic photography. And of course, a little bit like today, there was a real interest and concern with the realism that comes with that. How can we produce this imagery to be as realistic and seem to mimic as much as possible um, our world? So I'm quite interested in what happened to the 20th century when artists kind of turned away from photography and carried on using stereoscopy, but to see how that could bring about something quite different. So there's quite a few examples of this. I'll just do two major ones today. The first of which is Oscar Fischinger. So he has um, his stereo paintings from um, the late 1930s. And a few things about this. The first of which is that these were kind of quite large-scale paintings, um, so they couldn't fit inside a stereoscopic viewer. And his notes for exhibition expected people to be able to do the cross-viewing, free-viewing process to look at them. So if any of you are able to cross-view, uh, free-view, you'll hopefully be able to bring those sets together and see the stereoscopic depth relations in them. Um, so when you do this, what I find really fascinating about them is that you do get a sense of the depth, you'll see the triangular images kind of poking towards you, the circles kind of bringing forth in depth, but they don't fully resolve. Um, Fishing was very much, you know, painting these with the kind of, the best kind of perception he could at the time. Um, so there's a kind of strange vibration when you look at them, they don't fully resolve, you're trying to kind of bring them together, get them to converge. Um, and that for me is the most fascinating part of them, that when I watch them, uh, or when I view them, it's less about what I'm seeing in depth, and more about what the image is doing to me. What is this process? It's a little bit like the ghost images where something's not quite working in my head. And so this, for me, is what becomes really important about when stereoscopy is imperfect. Instead of being able to passively view it, instead of being able to fully relax, our bodies, our muscular eye motions become engaged, and we're reminded that we are there. We are spectators. We are actively involved in this viewing process. So in terms of commercial entertainment industries, of course, there's huge importance in producing very um, kind of intricate, delicate depth relations that won't kind of provide harm to the viewer, that will hopefully become an enjoyable experience. So some of the best stereoscopy should be where you don't notice the artifacts. So that, of course, makes sense in a commercial industry. But there's always those opportunities to step outside that and think about, well, when can we be reminded? So 
it's a kind of sidestep example, but if any of you are familiar with um, House of Cards, particularly that first season when Kevin Spacey began to talk to the camera, and that's a shocking moment. We're not expecting to be confronted when we're watching audio audiovisual material. So it's quite a distinct example, but an example that told us, hey, you're here watching this, think about yourself. And so these examples, these Oscar Fischinger paintings, in a very different way, do that same process. They say, think about your own body, think about how you are in relation to this artwork. Second um, example from the early 20th century is Marcel Duchamp's, um, I want to realize I've not got the title up there, sorry, but it's um, an octahedron image. And so what he got here was just quite simply, he found a stereoscopic image of the sea, a stereo set, not particularly interesting in itself, and they hand drew onto it. So similar to Fischinger, if you can free view this and bring them together, you'll see that the image, um, the graphic image doesn't fully resolve. But again, it's that same type of process of showing us how, you know, how does this image come into appearance? What does it mean? It opens up as many questions as it gives us answers. Tim O'Reilly writing about it says, the picture ultimately seems to achieve a confusion of spatial conventions. The perspectival, the stereoscopic, and the photographic. So this is what is interesting to me, is this confusion, the fact that we don't really know what we're seeing. We don't it's like great art. We don't really know what it means, but it makes us think about it. And hopefully in a longer process, it makes us reconsider our relationship to certain stereoscopic images. So if we're used to looking at a lot of 19th century photographs, it makes us see them in a new light with this overlaid image on top of it. Similarly, if we're used to, used to using graphic images um, for kind of stereoscopic scientific inquiry, suddenly seeing it transposed on top of the photographic makes, it see it, makes us see it in a different light. So there are artworks um, which, like good artworks, don't necessarily have an obvious meaning to them, but make us question what are we seeing? And again, who are we in this process? What are our bodies doing in trying to resolve those images together? So following on, with, following on with this very graphic concern, another example from the 20th century was Norman McLaren's animations um, from the 1950s. So what's interesting in terms of historically is that his animation, his stereoscopic animation, was first shown at the 1951 Festival of Great Britain. So those of you that know your 3D film history, that was a monumental moment. A couple of years before uh, the great 3D cinema boom, the classic era in the US, and you know, starting around about 1953. Um, so this exhibition in London brought together stereoscopic films, which were pushing the boundaries of what this new technology might deliver us. So there were films from the um, Spotters Woods, for example, and those were live action films, very much trying to create um, visually pleasing depth relations and to really show what this new stereoscopic film technology could do. They were building on previous examples. This was not the first examples of stereoscopic film, but they were trying to bring them to the public in a new way. Um, so Norman McLaren then inserts his works in the same festival in which he has these very abstract animations. So very much against the drive towards realism, the drive towards mimicking our natural world. Um, so on the one hand, like the other artworks I've been looking at, there's that same process of asking you, the viewer, to question what you're looking at, to be intrigued with what you're seeing. So it functions as, as an artwork. But at the same time, what McLaren was doing was he was also doing his own type of scientific experiment. So he says, and he wrote about this, that his team were interested in dispensing with some of the non-stereoscopic depth assessing factors normally present in stereo films, such as interruption of opacity, light and shade, chromatic hue and tonal perspective, in order to synthesize three-dimensional space from two-dimensional subject matter. So this is very much following on with a lot of the talks we've had so far, even the last session. How do we get rid of our monoscopic cues to fully understand what we're seeing as um, stereoscopic, as binocular vision? So that is what they were attempting to do within um, these films, and to use that as a type of way of being fascinated by stereoscopic depth and using that as a scientific process. 
So it harks right back to the original line drawings by Wheatstone, the ones that he used to, provide, uh, to prove his theories of stereoscopic depth in his mirror stereoscope. So I find these line drawings really interesting from a kind of 3D historian point of view, because often when I show them to students, um, they know that they were created in the 30s when photography was becoming a mainstream industry. And there's often a sense of, well, was this just because Wheatstone didn't have stereoscopic photographs available to him? On the one hand, yes, these were produced kind of around the time that they weren't available, but why they had a lasting impact was exactly the same thing that McLaren was doing, was to see what happens when you take away all the other monoscopic depth cues, what they can tell you. So these images have a really interesting lasting impact because they're doing that process of seeing what can you learn about stereoscopy from something that looks quite primitive, but is actually providing something that the more advanced photographic imagery can't show us in the moment. Um, and again, going back to the fishing examples, what I particularly love about these is when you bring them together, when you view them, they're still quite imperfect. You still have a, a little bit of issue resolving them, and you get that interesting kind of vibrating sensation of trying to bring them together, and what am I looking at? What is coming forward? What isn't coming forward? Where is the depth in this? So they become interesting visual objects, which for all their imperfections, um, intrigue the mind and ask us to fully engage with them. So this kind of legacy of more graphic type display um, was in some ways quite often forgotten when the kind of commercial mainstream industry really focused on how can we do stereoscopic displays, how can we make um, commercial mainstream product that will go towards that realism field. Um, so when digital 3D came back in, the public became very aware very quickly of the major studio examples um, coming through animation from Chicken Little, Polar Express, but into Avatar, as we all know, the big mainstream productions. Um, so I'm interested in an artist who is still working, and I'll get on to in a minute, but who is working in that time period and did something quite different. So Santiago Caicedo is a Colombian filmmaker. I think, I'm not sure if his work has been displayed here. He's won a lot of, he's, what, sorry? Yeah, he's been displayed, yeah. Yeah, um, so he won a lot of awards for um, his short film, Yuyui. So this was produced in 2011, and if you look at the type of animation that was being produced in the mainstream industry, and we saw a great example of that this morning with a short film, I think it's called Bao was the name of the short film? Yeah, Bao this morning. There was this real concern with, um, although animation was being made, type of realism in the animation, creating human figures and so on, but a real concern with roundness. So if you look at all the Pixar, Disney, um, stereoscopic animation that was coming out at this period, um, and it's still coming out today, all the characters are very rounded, they bulge towards us. Um, they're very, you know, they tend to favor kind of short squat um, round figures. Um, so Santiago Caicedo's work's different. Unfortunately, I've not got an example of this to show you, but you can get a sense from the image. It really plays with flatness. So the film is a short film in which you see these type of, um, this type of graphic display and this, um, kind of black silhouetted figure moving through space. Um, and it's all these geometrical images which they sit very much on pop-out planes. So if you know the kind of backlash that came out around um, the discussions of 3D in this kind of period, a lot of people complained that 3D has a pop-out or pop-up book effect, so those that very planar kind of delineation. And so a lot of the studios were quite rightly working as hard as possible to remove that very planar effect. Whereas Santiago Caicedo's work goes in the opposite direction, says, well, if we're going to have a type of planar pop-up book effect, let's push it to the absolute extreme. And that's what his work does here. So it's not imperfect in the same way that some of the other examples are that I've been showing kind of already so far. I would never call his work imperfect. It's very, very beautiful work. Um, but it does go against the trends in stereoscopic visual imaging that were happening around him. Um, and so his most recent feature, maybe that's it, um, Virus Tropical, this is an entire feature-length film, um, again uses not the same type of full-on graphic um, abstract imagery, but it does use quite a flat, planar type of stereoscopy, 
What is interesting is, unfortunately, he's been hit with a downwards trend in um, 3D cinema. So this feature has won numerous awards around the world, and it's played at film festivals that have in the past shown 3D films, but mostly it's played in its 2D version. But there is a stereoscopic version of this, and it is interesting, um, probably one of the few feature films to show this type of animation. We did see yesterday in the... Um, uh, the theatre exhibit, we did see some really interesting animation, including the kind of award-winning one we talked about this morning, um, that isn't following the Pixar Disney type of model. Um, so it's interesting when we see people working these ways that are going against the grain of what's often being achieved in other stereoscopy. Um, so Caicedo's work, um, probably some of McLaren's, is for all its... Um, planar flatness in certain ways and depth um, is still very visually pleasing. Um, an artist who pushes the absolute limits of what we might consider visually pleasing is Ken Jacobs. So he has been working with stereoscopy for decades. Um, he's often used anaglyph technology. He's moved into working with digital uh, technology. And he's always pushing the boundaries of what we can see with stereoscopy. He's very interested in how we deal with the past. So he tends to take found footage from early cinema, um, often the kind of turn of the century cinema, and then sees what happens when you take this footage, which you can watch in 2D, which is often a kind of historical artifact. What happens when you do something to it that produces a type of stereoscopic depth and how we might feel about it. So again, I'll use two examples to talk about. And again, apologies, I've not got the examples of these to show you, but hopefully if I talk you through, you'll get a good sense of them. So the first example opened in the 19th century, 1896. Um, when I saw it exhibited, it was using the Pulfrick um, effect. So do people know of the Pulfrick effect? Cool, some heads, yeah, for those who don't, that technology where, at its very basic, putting a filter in front of one eye gives a slight time delay. So if you have horizontally moving footage, um, that time delay will give you this, the appearance, the optical illusion of the same image being repeated with a horizontal disparity, giving a sense of stereos stereoscopic depth. So Ken Jacobs uses early cinema footage, often of passing trains, um, passing boats, but also footage that pans horizontally. So that also will give you the same pull freak effect. So what's interesting when you watch it is you do get a sense of stereoscopic depth, but it's quite a strange stereoscopic depth. It's not quite matching up exactly how you'd expect it to be. Um, and it's a really kind of eerie phenomenon. So it's really intriguing to look at. It can be quite painful to look at because your eyes are often trying to resolve this quite imperfect horizontal disparity. Um, so for Jacobs, the interest here is how we can see a new something that um, is a historic artifact, but we're seeing it in a very fresh way. But at the same time, we're being asked to go into the past to look anew at something that you know, might seem quite antiquated, might seem part of the past. So he really wants to try and bring us towards a new understanding of the past, a new relationship with it. And the other example which I want to talk about is the guests. Um, so this it was a film that, again, he used an early film, a film that was one minute in length. Um, and it was actually his wife, Flo, who collaborates with him on these projects. She went through the process of quite painstakingly separating out all the frames and then assigning every second frame to the left eye and every alternative frame to the right eye. So initially, they put these alternative frames, one for left and one for right, into a carousel-type viewer. Um, but when the kind of new digital technology came through, they created a DCP file, or they digitized them, um, so that, again, we had these frames, one for left, one for right, and they were then able to display them on a 3D cinema screen. So that's the format that I saw the guests in. And it's a really quite incredible experience because they're not only showing this um, film in this way, they've also slowed it down from being one minute long to 70 minutes. So this is like a sit in your seats, <laughs> get ready for the long duration. Um, what happens in a film is it is one minute 
of guests climbing the steps um, to a wedding inside a church. So there is horizontal movement as the guests are going up the steps. So again, by separating those left and right images, you're creating horizontal, you've got horizontal disparity in the horizontal movement, and you get a sense of stereoscopic depth. What you then get is 70 very long, <laughs> very arduous minutes of your eyes desperately trying to converge um, or kind of bring together this depth. It is hard going, <laughs> I will not lie to you. I brought um, some of my film students with me and I, th I think they kind of, about 35 minutes and I could see them kind of how much longer to go, but they did enjoy it. They did, they appreciate, well, enjoy is probably not the word, they appreciated it. Um, because it was fantastic. Um, what you did find was that you had this sense of stereoscopic depth, and every so often, just because of the horizontal disparity, a head would suddenly pop from seeming to be in relief to being inverted. Um, artifacts like that were happening, you know, every so often. So again, the process was less about seeing um, you know, new depth on the image. So if we think yesterday about Eric Curlin showed us this fantastic footage of Chaplin, which, you know, he'd converted into 3D from the two different camera sets. And that worked really well. That kind of showed us, oh, this is what it could look like in depth. This work is quite different. It's not really showing us this is like, oh, this is what it might have looked like to be there. This is a work that makes us think, what is happening to my eyes? What am I seeing? What is happening to these people? How did they exist in time and space? Um, how do I relate to them? So like I said, it's a long, long, arduous viewing process. It really taxes the muscles in your eyes to watch it. It's very much non-pleasurable stereoscopy. It's the antithesis of what we're aiming for in commercial industries. But the value of this type of work is that it's almost completely resets your relationship with stereoscopy. Once you've watched this, the next 3D film you watch, you can't help but be thinking about your body in relation to that film, what is happening in, in the way that you converge the images, what is happening in terms of, your, you know, the way you resolve them and see them in movie theater. So for all its imperfections in terms of its process, it really makes us think and feel differently about stereoscopy. So it's got value in that lens. Um, Ken Jacobs' work is absolutely fantastic. It's hard to get a hold of. Um, Ken Jacobs tends to do one-off screenings. Um, so if, you're, if you ever do see that he's doing a screening in your area, I have to jump on it because it's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime experience often. Um, and similarly, Caicedo's work um, you know, has got some good exhibition, but hard to find. Norm McLaren's work, you know, there's archive copies of it. It was, for a while, reproduced... Um, for the Nintendo 3DS, which just sounds a bit strange, but it was there, um, but hard to see. So these examples are challenging to get copies of. Um, one different example, which follows on from this hard, arduous viewing task, is Jean-Luc Godard's Goodbye to Language. Um, this was, um, could have made available a lot of movie theaters. He could have got in when a lot of the art house theaters were still putting on 3D films, which is great. So a large number of people have seen this. It played at lots of film festivals. I've written an article about this, which is open access. So there's a lot more I've got to say about this. You're very welcome to look at it if you're interested. But what I'll do today is I'll just talk of through one specific example. And again, talk about this process of the imperfection of it. So. If you've not yet got 3D glasses, this would be a good chance to grab them. I'll talk for a few more seconds just while people get it set up. Um, so what Goddard was doing in his film was he was doing a very typical Goddard film. If you've not seen Goddard films, they tend to be, and we'll just hold off a few seconds, it's all right, Dan. His films tend to be very meandering. They're very philosophical. They're full of characters that talk about quite complex, abstract things. There's not often a straightforward linear narrative or plot to his films. So rather they're films that ask you to think, to feel, and he's very interested in using visual images that are suggestive. Um, if, if you're a real Goddard fan, you can like go into and find the deep, you know, the very kind of esoteric references he makes to all sorts of historical, philosophical, political moments. Um, but often for the viewer, viewers, his films are quite challenging because they don't explain themselves. So Goodbye to Language is no exception. It very roughly follows 
two couples um, as they kind of go through life. There's some dramatic moments, but there's no obvious storyline in our kind of typical Hollywood narrative sense of storyline. So the clip we're going to see, um, it's in French. We've not put the subtitles on, um, but that's okay because at this point the characters aren't revealing anything, you know, kind of really about what's happening. They're just having quite a philosophical conversation that's quite abstract, that's not really, you know, telling you much about plot. Um, so when Goddard started working on this film, well, Goddard did a previous short 3D film, and that was part of a trilogy that showed it can, and then he made this feature length film. So he did not know his, his stereo, he knew his stuff, but he took a typical Goddard approach, which was to say, okay, there's rules around how you're meant to do 3D, and I'm just gonna make the film I want to make. So this is one of the more infamous scenes from the film, it's one of the more extreme scenes, um, and it, we get a similar scene happening another point in the film as well. So I'll talk you through it as we watch it, but this is Jean-Luc Goddard making 3D as imperfect and as painful as possible. Okay, so um, whose eyes hurt? <laughs> yeah, right? Um, so that is, that's typical Goddard, okay? Um, you could ask Goddard what does that mean? <laughs> and you'd get a very long-winded French answer. Um, and various people will interpret, I mean, you can do all sorts of philosophical interpretation about the splitting of the human soul and all sorts of things. And they're very valid interpretations. But I think the real takeaway from this is that at that point in the film, you're, it's suddenly brought to your attention very abruptly that you're absolutely watching a mediated experience, that this is completely artificial, the depth that you're seeing. And in fact, not only that, but your eyes are doing something quite important in this process. Your physiological body is active in this. So when, those, um, when the cameras split, when they completely kind of diverge from each other, that work that one eye is doing to try and resolve with the other eye, that, that complete impossibility, um, tells you something which you then carry with you for the rest of the film because you can't help but remember that, okay, I'm watching this through a lens. That I'm, and even if you don't know, for, you know, if you're a general audience uh, member and you don't understand how 3D technology works, you don't maybe realize that what's happened in that scene is a separation of two separate cameras, you still at the very least are made aware that you're seeing some type of optical illusion and that the, that optical illusion can break down at any moment, and it does another point in the film. So it makes us become quite suspicious, um, quite open to the fact that there's definitely no integral realism to what we are seeing here, and at any one moment, that illusion is going to disintegrate. So that's what's really exciting about Goddard's work, is just to have that put on the big screen to experience that. And again, I think some of the takeaway from it is that even if it is quite a painful viewing experience, again, it's quite arduous to make your way through a Goddard film, there's no obvious narrative pleasure from the characters, um, but some of the takeaway from it is that when you then go on to watch um, mainstream 3D works after that, it focuses your attention on, okay, what am I watching and how is this optical illusion presented to me? So it teaches us something quite interesting there. So I'm quite interested then in how this might transfer into some of the more recent uses of stereoscopy, mainly in 360, 360 degree stereoscopic capture. So the type of um, stereoscopy that's going to be used in virtual reality headsets. Um, so what I've tended to find is that the, the publicity, the commercial literature around um, imaging for the new 360 degree capture follows quite closely the type of publicity and literature around the kind of digital advent um, of 3D cinema. So when we were having 3D camera rigs being put out, um, when stereographers were starting to kind of ramp up into commercial mainstream industry, a lot of the kind of concerns was around that best practice, trying to really aim for the most realistic visual image, removing all the artifacts, making sure your horizontal alignments were correct, making sure ghost talk, uh, ghosting, cross talk, um, everything was reduced. So we see a great repetition of that with the new stereoscopic um, 360, they're often called VR cameras, and I won't get into a debate about what is true VR and not true VR, um, but 360 cameras, same concerns, 
trying to really push um, to make sure we have as few errors as possible so that the stitch lines between the image sets are as invisible as possible, so their horizontal um, match is as great as it can possibly be. And so the real push within this, and I completely understand why, it's, it's part of the commercial mainstream um, industry, is to go for the greatest realism possible. The idea that you can put on the headset, you will see this live action footage, and you will feel as if you're there. And within this concept, nothing will remind you, or nothing will kind of interfere. There'll be no errors, no mistakes, to make you realize that what you're seeing is an optical illusion. So what I'm interested in is what type of um, 360 filming might do something similar to the examples we've seen so far in this talk in terms of reminding us of the optical illusion to purposely play with imperfection, to purposely play with the errors and let us see them. So what I did last year, 2017, was I created a short 360 degree film called PND. This is a cheat because I actually shot it on a monoc uh, mono monocular monoscope. Uh, camera, the um, Samsung 360, but hopefully let me, you'll let me use this example because, well, we've got two image sets. It's not, it's not really stereo, but the process I'm using here is about thinking how this might um, work equally with monoscopic imagery as stereoscopic imagery. So if you know the Samsung um, 360 camera, it is small, it kind of looks like a golf ball. Um, it's got, it's technically got 4K, technically, um, which as you know, when that's unwrapped um, for your 360 image, you're losing a lot of resolution there. But even kind of beyond that, there's quite limited sensors in the camera. So you get a lot of noise in the image. You get a lot of overexposure happening. So my aim in this film, PND, was to actually play with that. So rather than try work towards reducing these mistakes, these errors, to really pu um, push forward the kind of the noise in the image, um, and also even post-production, kind of upping the overexposure, so that when you watch this short film, you become very aware of the material of the film, that you're watching something filmed around you, rather than be completely immersed into the environment. So it's very much absolutely against, you know, the great work that we saw in Tony Davis's presentation yesterday where he was showing, you know, the, um, their work to reduce the noise um, the, in the blue images for um, The Hobbit. So this is almost like the absolute antithesis of this, to try and push those. Now, because it's my own work, I'm not going to try and, you know, explain how successful or non-successful it is. But hopefully it's a pathway to just saying that there are opportunities within an art artistic sphere, within an experimental sphere, to step away from our attempts towards perfection and just to see what it brings to us. So I was really interested yesterday when we saw in the theater screenings, we saw the French, we saw a couple of works which had really interesting superimposition, um, kind of layering of depth fields. And that to me was really exciting, seeing something that doesn't fit our normal stereoscopic production, but makes us think about how these images are coming together. So I'd absolutely love to see someone doing something similar to that for 360 degrees, so we can get in the headset. And what does it feel like to be in that space, to realize that you're in a completely unrealist space, but it will hopefully make you feel something um, whether or not you have to make that a painful experience like Goddard did, it's completely up to you. But how that can allow us to feel and see something different, which doesn't distract from or detract from the other focus on creating perfect images for commercial work, but just allows a sidestep to something else. So that takes me on to, um, well, it takes me back to 3D cats with vertical video syndrome. So if you ask me, or if you ask anyone that watched this, that was shown in a few different locations around Wellington. This was at the Wellington anniversary celebration, the city, kind of strangely. If you ask people to see it, and if you ask them what it means, I don't really expect there to be an answer. It brought to, I mean, there's an academic answer, of course. It brought together a kind of cultural moment. It brought together our obsession with cats on the internet. It brought together our obsession with filming vertically on our phones. It brought together the kind of current backlash against 3D as being gimmicky. It brought together everything gimmicky possible in one display. 
so that was the kind of that's the academic rationale. But the personal rationale is that hopefully the people that saw it just saw something different. They saw something that they don't necessarily know what it meant, what it was for, but it'll hopefully have lingered in the back of their heads somewhere as a type of image they wouldn't otherwise see. And so for me, that is the value of some of this work, to just try and do something different that won't be seen elsewhere. So I recognize, <laughs> I'm glad I've not been chucked at the conference yet. Um, I recognize this is very different from the type of work that takes place, but hopefully it might be inspiring just to think about how, maybe not in your own work, how to do things which are imperfect and filled with errors and anomalies, but to seek out some of those works, or when you do see them, think about how it can refresh your own knowledge and your own, under, your own understanding of stereoscopy and where our bodies are in that process. So the last slide I'll do is just a quick plug for me, which is I run a site called stereoscopicmedia.org. And we have, a, so this is very humanities based. So we've got a bibliography um, of all the humanities papers relating to stereoscopy. So a lot of the historical examples I talked about today, they're written up more fully in articles and book chapters and books that appear in, in that bibliography. So if you are interested in kind of delving into the kind of more artistic experimental side and the historical side of stereoscopy, that bibliography has got a lot of information in there. Um, hopefully that will be useful as a, a kind of a different type of knowledge experience from the very, very excellent scientific engineering kind of work that's being done at this conference. And that's me, thank you.